Okay, hi everyone. Sorry for the uh, delay. We've had some troubles with um, with the link. I hope now everything works for everybody. But um, if you know of anybody who is trying to get into the stream and can't, the problem is um, the link uh, spelt Eric with a K rather than with a C. Uh, but otherwise, um, welcome to today's uh, Win uh, Summer Seminar. Today, we're very lucky to have uh, Eric Knudsen with us. Um, Eric uh, is a postdoctoral scholar at uh, UC Berkeley. His research focuses on the functional organization of cognitive network networks uh, necessary for flexible, goal-directed behavior. His work combines large-scale recordings of electrical activity from the cortical limbic network, behavioral modeling, and closed-loop electrical stimulation to dissect network function. Uh, he previously studied cortical learning processes during training with uh, the use of a brain machine interface. And the work he'll talk about today, which is um, really amazing work, um, focuses on studying how the hippocampus is involved in the structural organization of information during flexible decision making. Um, so we're really happy to have Eric here today. Uh, before Eric starts, I'll just remind you again uh, of the control features of Crowdcast. Um, on your right, there's a chat where uh, you can use that, that you can use for clarification questions or anything else that's on your mind or you want to say. Um, other members of the audience are more than welcome, more than welcome to answer um, the questions in the chat. And I'll also be monitoring that. And if there are any burning questions, I'll refer them to Eric. Uh, for any deeper questions, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. Um, I will refer these questions to Eric at the end of the talk, the top voted questions. Uh, please, when you ask questions, please indicate if you would rather not uh, be invited on the screen to ask the question. Um, right, so without um, further ado, Eric, the uh, floor is yours, and thanks very much for coming. All right, thanks, Alon, uh, for the introduction, and um, thanks for Beatrice for initially extending the uh, invitation to give this talk. I'm excited to be here, uh, virtually speaking, and uh, talk to you guys about the stuff that I've been working on in the Wallace Lab. All right, so the title of today's talk is Learning in Abstract Value Spaces. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is work that we've recently published in Neuron, um, and some stuff that I've been doing further digging down into hippocampal function. Um, during value-based learning. Um, so we'll just go ahead and get started. So the types of things that we're interested in the in the Wallace Lab, um, we essentially study the prefrontal mechanisms underlying cognition. Um, so a typical problem in the Wallace Lab uh, will have an animal trying to, to sort of evaluate two options. Um, so we have this ability to, to develop these sort of abstract stimulus outcome associations. So if I'm presented with a picture and then given a, a, a juice reward for that picture, these things become linked. Um, so we can say, you know, maybe half the time you'll get a reward uh, or 90% of the time you get a reward. And so these, these animals can learn these associations um, and then they're able to decide between them. So one of the questions we're after is how are these values, these uh, reward predictive stimuli encoded uh, in the frontal cortex? Um, so just by way of example, I'll give you a little cartoon here. So a typical task in the lab, we'll say we'll have three pictures. Uh, each one is associated with, say, an amount of juice that the animal will get. Um, so the animal learns to discriminate these things based on the outcome that it receives. You'll get some sort of behavioral function uh, of the likelihood of him choosing a particular picture uh, weighted as a function of the, the value that um, or the amount of juice that it gets. Uh, we then stick some electrodes into the OFC and study um, how these uh, associations are encoded. And you might get something that looks, that looks like this. So a typical OFC neuron um, that encodes the value of the chosen thing that he, uh, the thing that he ultimately chooses uh, might modulate its firing rate in this particular way. So in this example, um, this neuron fires maximally when he uh, chooses the highest value stimulus um, and minimally when he chooses the lowest value. Um, so the OFC world has been kind of divided into uh, two uh, schools of thought. Um, there's those that that will do these types of experiments and figure out what neuron, each neuron is sort of maximally reflecting in terms of, of what 
experimental parameter, it's encoding. And so, you know, these are, are sort of defined as functional subclasses of neurons within the orbital, orbital frontal cortex, encoding things like chosen value, the unchosen value, nothing, um, and that. And then you've got this other hypothesis that says, no, these OFC neurons are sort of reflecting the animal's current state within a task. So things like value, but also things that are independent of value, such as confidence, the identity of the thing that I chose, any sort of social things that are, are, are involved in the task. Um, and it's sort of a more population level representation of the, the internal state of uh, whatever the animal is doing. Um, so a good way to get at these things is to uh, force sort of a, a state transition function along, um, you know, built into the task. So if we have the initial uh, stimulus outcome association set at 0.5 and 0.5 in this versus 0.9 in this example, uh, we can call that state A. But then if we sort of reverse the contingencies and, and change the stimulus outcome associations, this gives us a good time point along which to sort of titrate uh, the, the underlying computations. Um, and as we know, this is sort of a, a measure of flexible behavior. And this flexible behavior is a key component of, of cognition. Um, so yeah, these state transitions basically give us a good opportunity to study things in a more naturalistic setting um, in the sense that, you know, things aren't always the same. We live in a dynamic world. Um, so by evaluating the underlying computations that occur during these transitions, we can get a better insight into the function of the region. So how do we study these? Um, so by studying the inputs and outputs of the system. So, you know, a neuron is going to encode something um, regardless of if there's a state transition or not. So what we want to do is step back and look for more meso, uh, meso level signals that might uh, more accurately track sort of these, these uh, transitions in state. Um, and one candidate uh, uh, neural feature uh, that, that might uh, do this is local field oscillations. Um, so these have been shown that, uh, you know, they, they, they're thought to promote communication between disparate brain regions. Um, so when two different areas of the brain synchronize at a low frequency, um, ensembles of neurons in these different populations can kind of sync up, modulate their rates together, and which we all know you fire together, uh, you wire together. And so this is sort of a, a hallmark of learning. Um, so what do we know about oscillations in the orbital frontal cortex? We know that OFC has a prominent theta rhythm. Um, and importantly, during associative learning, OFC neurons in the rat um, encode reward predictions uh, in phase with theta. So the question then becomes, during state transitions or uh, during learning, um, what is the role of orbital th frontal cortex theta? So in order to do this, we need a flexible learning task. So this is just kind of a, be a, a quick run through of the task that I use. So each day, the animals are presented with um, pairwise combinations of three pictures in a two alternative force choice framework. Um, so these uh, initial stimulus outcome associations are sort of arbitrarily assigned. The animal must learn these to a certain proficiency. Um, and once he does so, then we need to, we start to change the values and we do so in a correlated manner. So each picture at a certain point will begin to drift to a new value level, um, sort of in a correlated fashion. And then once the animal learns that contingency, they drift to a new value and so on and so forth until the animal gets tired of working. Um, so these are state transitions. The values are randomly walking to the next stable value. So just to convince you that, um, you know, monkeys are very good at doing this. So this is an example session from one of my guys. Um, so again, as I said, these, um, what I'm showing here is the, the values of the three different pictures. Um, the solid lines are the objective reward probabilities that the animal is exposed to. And then the dotted lines are the probability of him choosing that picture uh, given, you know, given the level of probability. So what we see over the course of a session, the animal is tracking fairly well um, to about 70 to 80% accuracy. Uh, the values of the pictures and he's, he's updating his choices um, in a flexible way. So now that we have a behavioral task, um, we need to be able to get into the brain and record. And so one of the things that I've done in the lab, um, you know, when I joined the lab, we were basically still doing tungsten recordings. Um, so we wanted to up the ante a little bit and be able to 
record uh, not just more neurons in general, but do so in a, in a more flexible way. And so we've developed this recording pipeline that basically combines uh, computer-aided drafting and um, 3D printing to give us a, a very flexible um, way of recording high density from, from multi-site probes, as you see in panel B here, um, from all over the brain. So what you're seeing here in A, this is sort of a, a silhouette of our recording chamber. This is sort of the direct axis we would have using traditional recording techniques, but we can basically tailor a trajectory in any angle that we want um, using this system and basically putting a tower, um, as you see here, uh, down into a traditional recording grid or a, a customized recording grid, uh, which enables us to um, collect neurons uh, basically anywhere within sort of a cone underneath the chamber. Now this is kind of a, a little hy hypothetical example, but this basically allows us to record from between one and 300 neurons um, a day. And while you can reach those with, with traditional chronic arrays like the Utah array, um, you know, this lets us do so at deep structures. So here is, is data collected from one of my animals um, doing three recordings in, uh, from three probes in OFC and four probes in the hippocampus. And we're getting about 300 or yeah, about 300 neurons simultaneously um, within a single recording. So obviously this has an advantage that we don't have to do as many recordings. Um, and it also gives us these large populations that we can start to do uh, higher higher population level analyses um, at single trial resolutions. All right, so the question of what is the role of OFC theta in value, learning and valuation? Okay, so we do the recordings while the animals are performing this baseline task that I've gone through. Um, and the first thing that, that, that we show is just um, confirming sort of the, what we already knew is that there is prominent theta activity uh, during the task. So I'm plotting here norm, uh, LFP power normalized to sort of the inner trial interval um, during the fixation epoch. And I'll get into why the fixation epoch is important later on in the talk. But what we see is in this four to eight Hertz band, what we're defining as theta, um, there is a prominent amount of activity uh, in theta relative to uh, all the other bands up to 60 Hertz. So when we look at um, the phase of theta, so this is basically a way of seeing how theta is aligned trial to trial, how consistent is this theta oscillation from trial to trial. Um, what we see is that it does align to two prominent task events. It, uh, it aligns to the onset of fixation and the onset of the pictures on the screen. Um, and it does so much more than, than its sort of neighboring frequency bands, the beta 13 to 30 hertz and the low gamma 30 to 60 hertz bands. Um, so this signal is very prominent. And importantly, it's modulated during learning. So if we do the same analysis where we take a chunk of trials and step it across a, a standardized learning window, so the, the learning periods in this task are, are um, variable in length. So we just do a sort of normalization procedure where we, we tabulate all the trials and, and make them the an equal length, um, what we see is a nearly 30% increase in the amount of phase alignment that we see trial to trial in the theta band. And importantly, this is independent of power. So if you have an increase of power, um, you might be more likely to see uh, uh, an increased probability of phase alignment, but there is no increase in power that is con con concomitant with um, this increase in phase. So we have this very prominent signal. Um, we know that it's modulated during learning. It appears to be sort of demarcating um, when learning is occurring. The question then becomes, what is the causality of this? So why is it doing this? Is this just sort of a, an epiphenomenon or is it causal? So one way we can test causality is, is through using stimulation. Um, so over the past decade or so, there's been increased focus on using intracortical microstimulation, uh, ICMS, um, during cognitive tasks. Um, so typically these are done in the open loop, but when they're done, um, they've been done in a number of areas. If you stimulate an infral temporal cortex during moving dots, you can bias perceptual decision-making. If you stimulate in the caudate, um, you can bias the values of op ambiguous options. So if you stimulate at, a, at an intermediate level value, you can increase the likelihood that the animal is going to choose it. Uh, more recently, uh, two studies have come out that 
you know, in OFC and ACC, where you stimulate an OFC, um, the authors were able to uh, bi-directionally bias decision making. And when you stimulate an ACC during an avo approach avoidance task, you can actually promote, promote avoidance behavior. But as I said, these studies have been done in the open loop, um, typically with high frequency stimulation. Um, so when you do open loop stimulation, well, when you do stimulation in general, you're affecting all local neurons equally. So, you know, if a neuron is encoding, say, you know, uh, positive value or, you know, value with a, with a positive sign. So the higher the firing rate, the more the value. You might have another neuron that's doing the same thing with the opposite valence. So it's in, it drops its firing rate at a high value. So you're affecting those firing rates equally. So typically what you get is, you know, most of the stuff washes out, but, and if you are left with a, a behavioral bias, they're generally very small. Um, so one of the things that, that, has come out of the Parkinson's literature is essentially using closed loop stimulation. So essentially what you're doing now is reading out the real time activity from the brain and using that as a control signal to drive your stimulator. Um, and this offers a way to deliver micro second duration perturbations without actually unnaturally driving uh, neural firing for extended periods of time. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, just a, a silly cartoon of, of how we do this in the lab. Uh, essentially you'll drop an electrode, a recording electrode, V-probe here, uh, down into the region of interest. And then in close proximity, approximately a millimeter away, uh, you'll drop a stimulating electrode. So what you're doing now is reading out the activity along this, uh, all, along the recording sites of this shank, um, and then using that, use some, using some heuristic. In this case, I, I'm triggering it at a certain phase and a certain threshold of power that I um, will determine sort of online every day. Um, each time we cross that that um, arbitrary threshold, we'll send a pulse of stimulation. So we went back, um, and so yeah, okay. So when we did the experiments, we did our closed loop stimulation. Um, this is where we are we are targeting. So basically, when we stimulate, um, our stimulation was most likely to occur on a rising edge of theta. Um, and this is consistent across both animals. And importantly, when we do this, because the, the stimulations are so short, we're talking on the order of 100 microseconds or two, um, we're not impacting the underlying firing rate. So if I look at firing rates in a, in a 100 millisecond window to either side of the stimulation pulse, um, there is no effect on the underlying firing rates. Okay, so we do this experiment. Um, Again, I'm re-showing this figure I've already shown. So this is what the behavior typically looks like. We did our stimulation in a blockwise fashion. Um, so we had a, a baseline pre-stim period where the animal learns the initial stimulus outcome associations and goes through one or two drifts, drift periods. Um, then I turn the stimulator on. And so what you basically are seeing here is that the animal is not updating his values. In fact, he's choosing the thing that is, is most, most valuable. He's choosing it much less than he ought to be choosing it. Um, and the critical thing, and so we're, you know, this is basically blocking reward-based learning. Um, he does learn it eventually, but it is sort of through a, a sheer force of will or brute force support approach, whatever you want to call it. Um, but the cool thing about this is as soon as we turn the stimulator off, uh, it washes out immediately. The animal goes back to his normal behavior. So that is this theta fixation case. So we have its variable effects, but, um, you know, they're all relatively large magnitude. You know, typically it takes between one and, and 30 so trials to to reach uh, a learning criterion. Um, now we're basically bumping that up into the hundreds of trials. So in order to uh, titrate these effects, we did a number of controls. Um, we repeated the closed loop stimulation uh, in that second epoch in which theta phase alignment was prominent, the, uh, the choice uh, epoch when the pictures come on the screen. Um, we did have a few days where we did have effects, but by and large, these were uh, relatively uh, no effects of that stimulation. We decoupled the, well, we opened back up the loop. And so we stimulated it at theta frequencies, but in an open loop way. So we just sort of randomly started stimulating after fixation onset. Um, and there are no effects. We stimulated in a closed loop way at the second half of the theta fixation. Um, there are no effects there. There is a prominent th theta phase uptick in theta phase activity uh, when the animal receives a reward. So we targeted that activity and there are effects. And to make sure this was a frequency specific effect, we stimulated during fixation at higher frequencies and that did not have an effect. So only targeting theta activity during fixation showed uh, reliably uh, slowing of learning. 
So the question is, what is the mechanism? So if we just go back to our phase alignment measure um, and you know tabulate how aligned theta is uh, while we're stimulating, what we saw was that there was a significant decrease in the amount of alignment that we saw um, that was not present in either sham or beta stimulation. Okay, so that doesn't really get at the mechanism. It just shows that, okay, theta is not really being aligned um, trial to trial when we're stimulating it. So why is that? Um, so what we did was looked at, uh, basically analyzed the relationship between phase and power and theta activity. Um, so typically what you'll see is that the more power there is in theta, the more likely things are likely to be, uh, the more likely they are to be aligned. Um, so what we're now is comparing sham and fixation. Um, so when we repeat that analysis during our fixation stimulation, what we see is that there's a systematic effect that we're basically decoupling uh, theta phase and, and, and power. Um, and sort of the mechanism that, that is causing this is that we are injecting power into the system, um, which is sort of triggering, I don't know if you want to call it an artificial phase reset, but it is sort of desynchronizing the ongoing oscillation. And importantly, our open loop experiments has sort of given us a chance to look at this in a little bit finer grain because we have sort of a randomly jittered start time. Um, we have a distribution of pulses that start at, at pretty much every phase of theta. Um, so what you're looking at now is, is the theta filtered LFP. Um, and each trace here now is, is at a subsequently a 30 second, 30 millisecond later uh, time window of what the effects are on this LFP. So basically on this rising edge of theta, if we hit a stimulation pulse, we're basically injecting power into the system, um, causing sort of a phase reset. Um, but during this sort of downslope of theta, there's no effect. And so when we target this with our stimulation, we're getting maximal effects on the LFP um, and we're getting these robust behavioral effects. And so when we stimulate an elite theta, which is typically falling in this window, there's no real effects and we don't see any behavioral consequences of that. So just a quick summary here, and I'm gonna check the chat to make sure we don't have any pressing questions. Um, but targeting theta events with closed loop stimulation disrupts learning by transiently decoupling theta from task-related behavior. I think we're okay. Yeah, I think right. we're good. Okay, cool. Um, right, so you know, I, I started off this talk talking about neurons. Um, so the neurons are the sort of workhorse doing the, the computation. So the question is how are, are uh, the neurons themselves interacting with this meso level signal. Um, so to do this, we, we basically verified the result from the rodent. So we looked at phase locking of, of OFC firing in general. So this is all the OFC neurons we recorded from and basically calculating, um, you know, what phase are the, firing, the spike times lining up to um, and then sort of looking at phase locking across trials, this is up to 30 Hertz now. And so what we saw is that OFC neurons were maximally phase locked to theta during the fixation epoch. Um, there's a little bit of phase locking going on during the options onset period. Yeah, when the options come on the screen, um, but primarily it is in this fixation window uh, when we had our, our stimulation effects on the behavior. Now, when we look at that same population of neurons that are phase locked to theta um, and figure out where on the cycle they are locked to, we see again that they are locked to the rising edge of theta and there's minimal locking going on on this um, downslope of theta where again, simulation has no effect. So, you know, by and large, the types of value analyses people have done, you know, you regress firing rates against task parameters. Um, this has done, been done sort of agnostic to uh, any sort of oscillatory uh, behavior. Um, so we went and did that analysis. We, so that what you're looking at now is an analysis of, of uh, the variance explained in firing rates by, by the values of the pictures um, when we went back and realigned the firing rates with respect to the theta oscillation. So we aligned um, the rates with theta, repeated the analysis, and then we took those aligned rates and then jittered them by plus or minus uh, I don't know, 50 milliseconds or something. I forget exactly what it was um, and repeated the analysis. So the take home here is that these neurons are more encoding more information when we align them to theta. Um, and then sort of a secondary result is that they are encoding more information about value uh, when things are moving. So when they're actively learning and tracking value to maintain their reward rate, 
OOC neurons are more engaged in encoding um, the values of the pictures versus the steady state condition. So if we go back and look at the vari variance explained by the neurons that we, that we captured uh, during our stimulation experiments, when we disrupt theta, um, we're also disrupting the ability of these neurons to encode value. So we're not directly impacting the firing rate of these neurons, but we are desynchronizing them from theta and basically uh, blocking their ability to do what they're doing during learning. You know, whether that's, um, you know, how, th how those dynamics are captured, we're not quite sure of. Um, and other people in the lab are working on that right now. But essentially what we're seeing is that these neurons are failing to, um, you know, keep track of the values at, uh, during drift periods. And so this has um, severe behavioral consequences. So, um, you know, because theta is prominent, um, we started to look outside of OFC uh, for theta. You know, uh, obviously there's, there's particular region of the brain um, that I'm thinking about when I think about theta, and that's the hippocampus. Um, there's been decades of work showing theta is important in the hippocampus when and animals moving around an environment and so forth. Um, so that's where we decided to alert, look. And, and, you know, it's important to note that hippocampus and OFC are part of the same frontal front cortical limbic network. Um, recently has been shown in the primates about five years ago that hippocampal hippocampus and prefrontal cortex uh, interact during associative learning. Um, and importantly, hippocampal theta modulates spike time dependent plasticity. So this is a, a process that's critical for learning um, and it seems to be linked to theta. Um, and yeah, so here's just a little schematic of where hippocampus is. It's very deep in the monkey brain and the human brain. Um, so not a lot of people do this. Uh, it's, it's harrowing to do, uh, but we did it. Um, so the first thing we did was just record local field activity from the hippocampus. Um, and we looked at, you know, the degree to which OFC and theta or uh, OFC and hippocampus are synchronized in the theta band. Um, so this, what you're showing on the top plot here is theta synchrony. This is um, a percent change from baseline. So, you know, obviously it's not zero, um, but looking at fixation and then choice, we have this strong uptick in the synchronization between these two regions, as we expect. And importantly, the synchronization is modulated again by learning. So there's a, a, a small, de a big de desynchronization uh, when learning initially starts. So when the animal starts to lose track of, of where he is and his performance dips, that's what these sort of background traces are. Um, this, the two areas become desynchronized as the new stimulus outcome associations are starting to, to be learned. Um, there's a big overexpression of the synchronization uh, later in learning. <clears throat> so we went back and we redid our stimulation experiment uh, using uh, the theta as the control signal in hippocampus this time and stimulating the hippocampus. And we essentially recapitulated the results that we got from our OOC stimulation. So when we stimulate disrupt theta in hippocampus, um, we have bigger, uh, you know, even bigger behavioral effects on in terms of their, their learning deficits. So the next question we wanted to ask is, you know, we have these, these two uh, stimulation results. We stimulate an OFC, we st stimulate an hippocampus, both disrupt behavior. We wanted to ask whether, if there was some driving force behind this, you know, the two areas are clearly talking to each other. Is there one that's sort of informing the other uh, more pr prominently than, than vice versa? Um, so we used this measure of general, generalized partial directed coherence. Um, and so essentially this measures the directional influence between uh, two time series signals. How well can you predict one from another? Um, so on the left here, I'm showing this is during our baseline learning. So what we see is <clears throat> when there's no learning being taking place, um, you know, the two are talking to each other back and forth fairly equally. Um, as soon as learning starts, hippocampus starts to um, be the main driver of theta activity. You know, so the, the information is flowing from hippocampus to OFC. And then after learning sort of stabilizes and the animal moves on to the next contingency set, um, these things go back to more or less baseline levels. Um, so we did the same analysis for our stimulation results. Um, and so this is gonna be normalized now to baseline. So what we see is that when we stimulate an orbital frontal cortex, we see a, a about anywhere from 50 to 60% or 30 to 60%, excuse me, drop off in this, this um, 
directed information from OFC to hippocampus. So this, you can imagine this pink line dropping by about uh, 30 to 60% during learning. Um, but this, the, the cyan trace was, was not really affected at all when we did that. Um, when we did the hippocampal stimulation, we saw a drop in both. So what this basically means is that, you know, disrupting theta in hippocampus is disrupting the ability of these two areas to communicate and disrupting the information that's flowing from hippocampus to orbital frontal cortex. So this is a good stopping point. Check. Yeah, Victor, yeah, and, Victor and Tango well. are the two animals, yes. Um, okay, so in this last part of the talk, um, I'm going to talk about uh, what the hippocampus is doing uh, at the single neuron level. Um, so as I kind of start, uh, talked about at the beginning of the talk is that, you know, we think that rather than there's these sort of like functionally distinct representational classes of neurons in OFC, um, the OFC is sort of utilizing uh, a task model or, you know, basically inferring from a task model the current state of the task and sort of the information is reflected in that regard. Um, so what is the task model is essentially a systematic organization of knowledge in Tolman's words. Um, and again, this is a, a concept that has long been associated with the hippocampus. Um, we all know that another sort of map is instantiated in the hippocampus. So this is a schematic of a rat moving around an environment and each dot is a action potential from a hippocampal neuron. Um, and so this cell forms what we call a uh, place field within this space. Um, and this is a, a canonical result in the rat. Um, and so, you know, what we started to think about is that, you know, because all the picture values are moving together, uh, our task is a relational task. So there's a relational structure within our task, um, something that has also been implicated with hippocampus. So if we think about each picture value independently, it might look at something like this, but if we plot this in a relational space, you know, this becomes a trajectory through that space. Um, and this is just by way of example. Um, so we started thinking about hippocampal activity. And so the, the hippocampal neurons we record are typically, um, you know, sparsely firing. They, they have bursts of activity kind of sporadically throughout the task. Um, so we started to try to think about how this might map onto the task. Um, and so we used this relational framework to look at how neurons are firing. Um, so just from our, our baseline experiments, we have, you know, a small handful of hippocampal neurons that we record. Um, when we project these, these firing rates onto this relational space, what we saw is that the space was tiled by these cells. So these are six hippocampal neurons we recorded simultaneously, um, to sort of sorted by where in the value space that they're firing. Um, but what we can see is that these seem to have sort of place-like properties. Um, so for the remainder of the talk, I'll call these value place cells. You know, we can argue about if these are place cells or not, um, but that's what we're going with, uh, just purely based on this sort of behavior. So one of the, the limitations of looking at it in this task is that we have a non-repeating space. So as I said before, our trajectories were kind of chosen uh, willy-nilly if you will, um, just sort of picked arbitrarily so we don't have any clear trajectory through space um, and there's limited predictive structure. Um, so we're not able to test a number of the, the canonical uh, features of place cells such as um, you know repeatability within the space if we're not visiting that, sp that spot in the space more than once. So we went back and um, did another series of experiments which we're currently working on right now. Um, where we wanted to get at some of these uh, place cell hypotheses. Um, so the first thing we did was, was just basically design a circular path through the space. Um, so just for visualization, these are offset, but the animal's making multiple passes along this circle uh, without any sort of offsets whatsoever. Um, so in this experiment, we basically had the animal make two passes through this space while we record from hippocampus. So if we project this onto a, a one dimensional axis, it just sort of looks like the sinusoidal pattern of, of values. Um, and then the green and the, the orange shades are, are the two different passes. So what we saw is that uh, a lot of individual hippocampal neurons are firing consistently on repeated traversals of the circular path. So these are just, uh, what, 12 examples 
of neurons that seem to have uh, similar place fields just qualitatively. Um, so we do the analyses, uh, basically a set of criterion to, to ensure to test for place-like activity. So, um, you know, we're using spatial information uh, compared to just sort of bootstrap levels. Um, and there's a number of other uh, criterion that I won't go into here, um, but essentially about 50% of the neurons that we recorded across the two animals showed uh, evidence of place-like activity on at least one of the two passes. Um, okay. So of the place cells that we saw, we went and did a correlation analysis, um, basically correlating the or a spatial correlation analysis. So we're, we're correlating the activity on one pass versus pass two. Um, and about 40% of those neurons were significantly correlated in space. Um, to Sanity check this, uh, we did a couple of controls. Uh, so we did a spatial shuffle, just shuffling up the, the bin in which the neuron's firing um, and then recalculating the correlation. Um, and so we have significantly more than that. And sort of in a, a competing hypothesis might be that these neurons are just firing periodically in time because we know hippocampus um, does that. It, it keeps track of the passage of time. So we did a temporal correlation as well um, and basically show that, you know, the, the amount of correlation that we have uh, from pass to pass is, is much more than, to, than is expected uh, when we look at just temporal firing rates. Okay. So what we have here is evidence for a relational code uh, for value represented in the activity of hippocampal neurons in the form of value place cells. Um, so I think I stole this from Tim, uh, this little diagram here. Uh, but essentially what you've got is sort of three pictures. Um, these little links represent sort of the relationships between the different pictures. And you've got these hippocampal neurons that are actually representing those relationships rather than the pictures themselves. So, the next question we wanted to ask, uh, and the final question that I'll talk about today, is essentially um, if we change the context of the task, but we preserve the underlying structure, so the underlying path uh, that the animal is traversing is changed, um, you know, how are these cells uh, uh, going to behave? So in a typical rodent experiment, um, so the fairly uh, common result now, you've got this idea of place field remapping. Um, so this can be either a global shift, so the place field will actually shift, or uh, as I've shown here, this is sort of uh, what they call rate remapping. Um, so they change the sensory context of the environment, um, and this cell fires much more prominently in one sensory context versus the other. <clears throat> So in order to do this experiment, uh, we impose, impose this same A, B, A prime uh, task structure. Um, but the change in context that we did was, was the pictures that are being used. So we have one picture set in A. Once the animal makes a complete traversal of the circle, we switch to a new set of pictures, um, which are, they're all totally novel. So the animal doesn't have any sort of knowledge of relationships between pictures between blocks. Um, and then in the A prime block, we went back to the original one. So the hypothesis here was that essentially, um, because the animal needs to learn the initial stimulus outcome mappings of these pictures, um, you know, the relationship between A and B in terms of what the place cells are doing uh, is going to be relatively minimal. And then when we reimpose this initial A, uh, the initial picture set we should see some sort of representation that looks a little bit more like A than it does like B. Um, so what we do is, what we see is that cells that are, you know, quantified as, as place cells. Uh, in this ex experiment, we found about 65% of the cells were uh, met our criteria. Um, what we do see is that we do have some remapping. So in this top right example is a good example. This neuron seems to fire at the bottom quadrant of the circle on pass A. We switch the pictures, then it becomes primarily active up in this kind of upper left corner. And then we switch back to A, a prime um, and it fires back in the same place. Okay, uh, but we do see some, some other patterns of activity here. Um, you know, this is a good example where it fires in one place in A. Um, fires in a different place in B, and then A prime is sort of a, a hybridization of those two. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a few slides. Um, so I repeated the correlation analysis, and as we'd expect, you know, we did see significant correlations in all pairwise, blockwise comparisons. So A versus B, A to A prime, B to A prime. Um, and as we hypothesized, we saw uh, fewer, um, about 
half as many neurons were significantly correlated between A and B than the A and A prime. Uh, but the cool thing is that we have a lot of correlation going on between B and A prime. Um, so about roughly equal amounts of, of significant correlations between A and A prime and B and A prime. So this doesn't get at sort of what the neuron, this neuron's doing in these two cases. So I went further and sort of broke this down by all the different combinations of, of where the correlations might be significant. Um, so if we had a full remapping from A to B and then a full reemergence in A to A prime, um, this blue pi would be taking up the majority of the situation uh, of this pi. Um, but essentially what we're seeing over half the neurons, and this is true for the second animal, um, seem to be generalizing. So they're either significantly correlated only from B to A prime or A to A prime and B to A prime. Um, and so what we're thinking is that this map is sort of integrating all prior experiment experience across context. Um, as long as the underlying structure is preserved um, when the familiar context is reinstated. Um, and I will show you now how this is uh, impacting behavior. Um, so the question is how this, how is this spatial structural knowledge uh, exploited? So, um, when we did the baseline task where the paths through the, the relational space were just arbitrary, there, there was no real predictive structure in the task. The animal's behavior was, was fairly well um, explained by a simple model-free approach. So just using a temporal difference RL learning algorithm. So, um, you know, updating values based on a prediction error term, which is derived from the value of the thing on the previous trial um, and the, the outcome that the animal received for choosing it and then just generating choices through a softmax function, we could explain between 50 and 70% of the behavior. When we look at the behavior on the ABA uh, task, um, the important thing to note is that the average performance across the value spaces is the same. Okay, so ABA, uh, you know, just take it, they're all performing at about 60%, 65% correct. Um, but this A prime behavior seems to be deviating uh, much more from A and B than A and B deviate from each other. And importantly, this, this is not like a motivational effect or anything like that, because if we look at the reward rates uh, for each of these um, blocks, uh, they don't uh, differentiate. So, you know, even though the animal's performing worse out here and better over here, uh, he's receiving relatively similar amounts of reward. Okay. So, we wanted to sort of reformulate uh, the reinforcement learning model to sort of imbibe it or imbue it with, um, with some spatial knowledge. So this is kind of the approach that we took. Um, rather than just doing a, a simple temporal difference uh, learning step, now values are, oops, excuse me, values are being updated as a mixture of temporal difference um, and sort of this memory component that we're building into the function. So temporal difference, as I said, is the same. Um, and this memory component is going to be sort of a remembered future value position um, offset by uh, epsilon trials in the future. So this is a free parameter that we use and we let the, the data dictate what this is, you know, how much the animals remember and how much they're waiting um, sort of upcoming changes in the future. Um, so the space itself, we're actually modeling as uh, collapsing that into one dimension by saying, how far away from a stable point am I in space? And this, this works because we have a circular trajectory um, and, you know, between stable points on the, on the distal ends of the circle, um, you know, we have this function of distance traveled, um, which can be fit nicely by a cosine function. And so we're using this mixture term uh, phi here uh, defined by this, this uh, cosine function. And then we've got this other free parameter here that essentially weights the relative importance of the two different regions of space. So it, um, I'm not showing it here, but if we think about what the actual one dimensional trajectories of this circle look like, you've got a sort of high sweep and a low sweep through value. So on this first pass, uh, the first half of the value space is sort of high value. So this is when the stakes are higher. Um, you know, 
changing contingencies is going to have a big impact and reward. Now, when you're in sort of the low value region of space, you know, choosing one over the other is not necessarily that important. So this mixing term basically allows us, or the, this, this weighting term allows us to sort of weight this distribution uh, by the relative performance. And again, that's a free parameter that we let the data decide uh, what it is. All right, so when we do this, I'm showing data now from my second guy um, on pass three. But essentially what you're sh looking at here, this is the, the TD algorithm um, predicting the behavior and then the model-based or positional learning approach um, on the right here. So basically what you're seeing is that the, the simple TD cannot capture the behavior of on pass three, whereas it does capture the behavior on, on A and, and the A and B blocks, excuse me. Whereas this model-based approach now is capturing behavior on the A prime block, but it's not capturing the behavior on better than temporal difference on uh, A and B. So this is just a summary from one of the animals. Basically, there's there's no overfitting going on. Our AAC values are, are better uh, for temporal difference in A and B um, and better for the model-based on the A prime block. And um, you know, as I said, we're explaining more variants in the behavior using temporal difference on A and B. So when the animal has to learn the pictures fresh, he seems to be using a temporal difference approach. But once he has this sort of generalized knowledge of the space, when we switch over to the model based, it's explaining uh, about 50% of his behavioral variance. So it's not a perfect model, but it's, it's doing much better than, than a, a typical temporal difference approach. Okay. So let's go ahead and put everything together. Uh, we've got populations of neurons in hippocampus and OFC. Hippocampus is providing a relational model of the value space, and OFC is ge generating reward predictions uh, with currents or question mark future locations in that value space. So the animal has knowledge of where he is in space. That information is being transmitted via theta to the orbital frontal cortex. Um, so if we think about this now in, in between space and firing rates here, um, so a neuron, uh, a cup, you know, a few neurons in this population are signaling I'm in this spot in space. That information is transmitted. It's telling me that picture A is better than picture B. OC is representing that um, in its firing rates, and the animal is making a spatially local optimized choice. Now, when things start to change and the animal has knowledge of those upcoming changes, um, a different set of neurons in the hippocampus might be signaling, hey, uh, the value of B is going to become more valuable than A uh, upcoming in the future. So that information might be transmitted to OFC. Um, this is hypothetical at this point. Um, so perhaps OFC is now encoding uh, maximally for picture B. Um, so this might be a spatially prospective optimal choice. So. In the moment, it might be suboptimal, but it might be a reflection of, of updating his contingencies um, in advance of, uh, with advanced knowledge of, of the change coming up in order to sort of update his behavior. When we stimulate, um, disinformation seems to be blocked, so we're desynchronizing theta from these two regions. Hippocampus might be signaling the same thing. Uh, that information's not being uh, transmitted to OFC. So OFC is falling back to what it already knows, saying A is better than B, even though that might be, be true. And so that is now a spatially stagnant suboptimal choice. Um, so when these things fail to update because of the stimulation, uh, you basically stick with what you know, uh, which results in uh, an, uh, a deficit in learning. All right, so the continuing work um, that I'm doing, I've only shown you two of the four experiments we did uh, for our paper. Um, so we've extended our, our look at the place cells into three dimensions. Um, and we've also begun to explore directionality effects of that. So using multiple approaches uh, through a, a central region of space. Um, as I just touched on, uh, I would like to look at, you know, is OFC using some sort of future representation predicted by the model? Uh, we do want to maybe look a little bit more at uh, contextual changes. So doing an ABA task, but switching the trajectory to see if we, um, you know, if hippocampal neurons fail to sort of generalize across different trajectories. Um, and then sort of our, our longer term goal right now is, is implementing neuropixels uh, to do these same types of experiments. Um, you know, we've done some OR recordings with the with the rodent versions of the probes, but uh, we've basically deemed those not really usable in the primate. Um, so we're kind of waiting to get our hands on some primate versions of these probes. 
So I'm right at 45 minutes. Um, I would like to acknowledge our funding. Um, so we're, we've got a lot of NH funding. Uh, some of the initial work that I've done in the lab was, was sponsored by DARPA. Um, and then I'd like to thank uh, Joni. She's a wonderful PI. Um, our, our great grad student, Suzanne and Celia, our new grad student, Nate, and our new lab manager, Lauren. So um, I will alt tab out and leave it open for questions. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Eric. That was a completely amazing uh, uh, bits of data, really incredible. Um, so we have a few uh, questions from the crowd. So I'll, um, I'll invite people on the screen to ask the questions. Um, you need to accept, don't forget to accept. So Oliver, I'm inviting you now. So you need, you should see, um, see it popping. Uh, some uh, clapping going on in the chat. <laughs> Emoji claps. Thanks, oh, everybody. I hope you're uh, loving the anticlimactic, anticlimactic moment of uh, finishing. Um, <laughs> Oliver is not um, coming, uh, so I will ask the question for him. Um, so the question is, uh, how confident are you that the... Oop, this jumped away. How confident are you that the observed perturbation in choice was due to a deficit in value learning rather than, for example, a failure to represent the values of the presented options after Q onset or failure to represent the chosen option? Would your stimulation timing in the trial help exclude these latter possibilities? Um, yeah, I think. I think your question kind of answers itself in terms of what I'm thinking. Um, you know, basically when we stimulate, if we are perturbing the representation of the pictures after they appear. Um, so it's important to note that, that what we're doing is stimulating before the animal has any knowledge of, of what they are. And so you, you kind of touch on that in the question um, by basically saying, you know, is that sort of upsetting the, uh, the representation of these images after they appear? So once the animal has knowledge of what they're doing, um, I don't think so, uh, because, you know, essentially we stimulate during when the options are appearing, um, and there's no effect on the behavior. Um, one of the things I didn't talk about also is, is reaction time. So presumably if we're, if we're disrupting their ability to represent the pictures, um, that would add some, some noise in the decision-making process in the sense of, you know, they might be deliberating more, um, but we did not see really any reaction time effects of, of stimulating per se. So, you know, if the animal is, is queuing up his decision before he knows what's coming, um, you know, so yeah, I mean, basically no reaction time effects suggest to us that, that we're not scrambling him up in terms of his ability to discriminate the things that are on the screen, but rather to, you know, basically update his values. Yeah. Uh, great. Um, and uh, Chris, I'm inviting you now to the screen. Let's see if this works this time. Ah, yeah, uh, so I'll ask for Chris. Um, uh, so in your circle experiments, would you not get something that looks like a partial value place code, even if the cells just had a rate code for value with different gain for the three stimuli, can you rule that out? Yeah, so I've done some some control analyses to get at this question, um, and basically, you know, because it's a circle, there's a, a lot of uh, collinearity between the circle and the place, um, you know, in terms of value. Uh, but I do get neurons that do that. Um, but importantly, it's, it's not all the place neurons. So, you know, it's something like 20% of the neurons are, are encoding value as, as we would think of it, uh, but the other 80% aren't. Um, so because there is a small degree of overlap, I'm not gonna say that, that hippocampus isn't doing that, but uh, at the same time, um, I'm not saying, every neuron's not doing that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, cool, thanks very much. Um... And 
Tim, I'm inviting you now, or you can also opt out. Seems to be a thing today. Everybody's shy today. <laughs> um, but Tim is usually not so shy, so he might come. <laughs> um, there, we, there we go. That's Tim. Hi. Uh, I don't really need to go on the screen either to ask my question, uh, but I'm bored of listening to Alan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I didn't really I didn't really get the last part of the talk and it sounds amazingly interesting and I want to get it and so I basically just want to, you to repeat it so maybe I could just explain a little bit what I thought you were saying and uh, so sure I, I, I thought you were saying that uh, the the cells had the same place fills between a and uh, have different place fills between a and b but then in a prime half of them are this half of them are the same as A and the other half are the same as B. And then yes. and then in the behavior you had something saying something was being memorized in A prime, but I didn't know what was being memorized and from what. I didn't know whether it was being memorized from A or from B. I didn't know what it was that was being memorized. I, and so, so I yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of an open question for us right now, but, you know, just looking at a few of these examples, like the one I pointed out here, right? So you've got this cell firing in A, um, it fires up here in B, and then on A prime, it fires in both places. So this cell would be correlated with both A and B, right? So essentially, you know, I'm calling this generalization in the sense that, you know, the animal is able to identify, um, you know, I've run th been through a circular trajectory once, with one set of pictures. I got new pictures, you know, holy crap. But then by the end, he realized he's gone through the circle again. And then once the third uh, uh, block rolls around, he knows he's already in a circle. And so we've got this sort of like hybridization of the map in terms of, you know, I know I'm in a circle, so I'm gonna utilize my prior experience generalized across both my two prior experiences to then, to then update my behavior. So when we look at the behavior, um, you know, it's it's kind of a noisy readout here, but basically what you see is that, you know, they typically are able to better anticipate this change. So there's not as, as much of a drop off in value here. Um, and then out here, this this guy doesn't seem to care so much in the low values part. So this this result holds up a little bit in the two pass as well. Um, so if he's made a single pass trajectory, he does the second pass with the, the same set of pictures. We see the same effect. Um, so, you know, whether or not we're sort of uh, you know, B is adding anything per se. Um, I mean, it just seems to, to follow from the experiment that we're doing. But, you know, basically, if I just do A, A prime, A prime is informed by A. If I do A, B, A prime, A prime seems to be informed by both A and B. And so in this, uh, in, so, to th so firstly, in, in the, I, I guess, other questions, so I won't, I won't take too long, but in the cells, you're saying that somehow a memory, is, so A and B are different, but something binds them together into a new representation, which already knows a circle. And then mm -hmm. that's that's what you're saying. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd be interested to know how that happens if you've got ideas, but not. But I'm sure other questions should happen first. I don't know. This is a fairly new thing. We're still thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, I agree. It, it's a completely amazing. Uh, like the last part is looks really interesting. I'm also really keen to see what's happening, to yeah. see how it will develop. Um, cool. I'm gonna kick you out. And uh, uh, Elliot, um, I'm inviting you to the screen now. It always takes a bit of time, and there's these awkward moments where we wait and see. <laughs> um, okay. ah, there we go. Um, that was amazing. Uh, just regarding the the neuron paper, I haven't dug into your discussion there, but um, whether that theta bump at the fixation period is going to be specific to context where you have that. Q before the choice comes on, or you expect this to yeah. have situations with spontaneous. Uh, I mean, it's the, the timing. I got, Yonsei has a question too about whether it's you know an outcome or. Sure, I mean that's an interesting question, um, and not really something I've thought about. But uh, when I'm thinking about it now, um, you know, I I think that 
if you remove the queue and keep a you know a consistent temporal spacing between the trials, it would still be efficacious. But if you sort of had a randomized ITI, you know, basically the brain's going to represent information as quickly as it can. So if the animal is forced to react by sort of having a, a randomized ITI, he doesn't know when the trial is coming. Um, in that case, that big bump in fixation activity probably wouldn't be as prominent. Um, there's less to align to, right? Um, in that situation, my feeling would be that stimulation would be would be uh, effectful when the pictures come on. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, basically when, when the information is queued up, then that's sort of when uh, you know stimulation is going to have its most effect. And I'll just go ahead and ask uh, my colleague's question too, because it's on the same theme. Um, if you think it, why wouldn't that happen at outcome when the updating is is might be happening about the uh, values of the options? Um, well, I mean, we think that, you know, basically that the outcome and, and, and that sort of updating is, is, you know, more straddle in nature, perhaps. Um, and what, what hippocampus job is doing is, is essentially prediction, right? So I'm taking the thing that I, I, I'm integrating it and I'm developing a prediction, uh, based on the outcome of the previous trial. And so if you're messing with that prediction, that's when the effects are happening. So, um, and you know the the outcome itself, you know that that theta might not necessarily have the same type of function either. Um, it's it's an interesting question. And and the you know basically what I saw in theta and I didn't show and I didn't include in the paper for this reason is that we only had a large theta when when the animal received a reward. So when he doesn't get a reward, there's no theta. Um, so yeah, I mean it's got sort of a differential effect there uh, as well. Um, Cool. Yeah, so if you think about, yeah, an update is, is both directions. If we're only impacting one side, then then who knows what's going on. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Elliot. Um, uh, next up, we have, um, who is this? Ah, Tom Ackham. Uh, you are invited to the screen. Hello. Hi there. Hey. Yeah, so um, I was just wondering how many times have the monkeys seen these circular trajectories? When you're recording it's, a, and... it's a great question. Um, and it's something that we're, we're thinking about looking at um, for our analyses. Um, not more than a handful of times, you know, four at the most. Um, so basically, you know, when I first started piling these experiments, it was just basically throwing them in there because it's, it's really, you know, fundamentally no different than the things that they've done a thousand times before, right? Um, and the only thing that's sort of hidden from them is the circle. So it was minimal training in this um, beforehand. Um, yeah, I mean, so one of the things we want to think about looking, if we have the power to do so, is sort of looking at, you know, sort of er relatively early exposures versus relatively later in terms of this generalization stuff and seeing, um, you know, how much of that effect is is weighted by their experience in the task as well, because uh, you know as soon as this is all they're doing, as soon as they see the pictures change, you know it stands to reason that they should know what sort of experiment they're in, uh, because we don't do this for any of the other um, trajectories. So yeah, that's a great question. Um, Just to I don't have more. Brief, briefly expand on that, because so you think that these neurons are really coding a position in a three dimensional space, not a point, not a point on a one dimensional line. Uh, I guess that's what I was trying to get at. It sounds like that's more likely. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And our, our model sort of simplified that. But um, yeah, I mean, it seems to be, uh, you know, mapping to the pertinent dimensions of the task. Thanks. And and yeah, so the, the data that I talked about in my, my sort of conclusion, looking at sort of the three-dimensional stuff, um, yeah, I mean, really what I see uh, is you know, as we sort of have this sort of helical structure, um, what we see is not only are they firing sort of an adjacent within the plane, but as we move out of that plane, there's sort of, you know, there's a greater response in that direction as well. Okay, cool. Thanks very much. Well, thanks. Um, cool, I think um, uh, we are done with questions. Can you use these questions? We're already asked. So, um, 
yeah so thanks again for a really incredible talk um i enjoyed it very much and i'm sure everybody yeah. else did uh seeing uh, clapping um <laughs> thanks everybody for joining today um yeah thanks guys thanks for your time everybody all right cheers i'm gonna end the broadcast all now right. see you soon all right. all right take care everybody